What makes a vampire film? If our supposed vampire likes the taste of blood, but doesn't have any supernatural abilities, are they still vampires? What if they don't bite their victims, but instead cut them with a razor blade? Or what if the quote-unquote vampire at the center of a horror movie appears supernatural, but could also all be a figment of our protagonist's imagination? I sit here and I can't believe that it happened. And yet I have to believe it. Where does the vampire movie end and the psychological horror begin? Dreams or nightmares, madness or sanity. Throughout the 1970s, with the vampire movie already being such a well-established subgenre, American indie directors were having fun posing these questions and subverting the vampire tropes. Two films in particular, one in 1971 directed by John Hancock, the other by George Romero in 1977, proved that even outside of the classic gothic tradition, there was still plenty of life left in the subgenre. Vampire. First, I will save your soul. Then, I will destroy you. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of the vampire and we discuss Let's Scare Jessica to Death and George Romero's Martin. Nosferatu. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our eighth season exploring the evolution of the vampire, and this is part 11. This week's episode is sponsored by $20 Patreon subscriber Ian Thompson, and in this week's episode, as as that intro suggested, we are going to be looking at two incredible indie American vampire movies from the 70s, Martin from 1977 and Let's Scare Jessica to Death from 1971. Both of these discussions will be spoilerific. Both movies are genuinely brilliant. Give them both a watch before listening to our discussion. So let's get straight into it. Plenty to cover this week. Joining me to discuss these two masterpieces, uh, a longtime friend of the pod. He's been here with me since the very beginning. Uh, I think his first appearance was on our Giallo episode, which was maybe episode two of our first season, uh, as well as being a hugely successful award-winning practical effects and makeup artist. He is also the co-host of the Arrow Video Podcast. It's Dan Martin. Hello, Dan. Hello. It's been a while. How are you? It has been a while. Yeah, really good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm doing very well. Surviving the heat. Oh my god, it's unreal right now on the day we're the day we're recording this is the day england is basically on fire right it's it's not yeah, I mean, it's not literally great. in some places yeah right <laughs> exactly terrifying uh so what have you been up to dan you've been busy right lots of projects on the go anything you can tell us about at this stage i can't i can't talk about the things i'm working on right now um mm -hmm. but i have four pictures playing at fright first this year <gasps> amazing what have you got um which is very exciting uh, so we have uh, a wounded fawn, Travis Stevens' new picture. Yes, um, excellent. Which is yeah, I think people are going to like that. It's pretty weird. <laughs> um, we've got swallowed, the new picture by Carter Smith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which yeah, I think that's definitely going to that's definitely going to resonate. That's amazing. Amazing. Um, uh, Scott Lias' uh, creature feature, walking against the rain, um, which we shot quite recently. That was that was quite a turnaround. Um, and uh, and then I did a little bit of stuff for Jonas Gewurz's uh, Hazard as well. Oh wow! And you're That's doing playing. the Arrow the Arrow Video Podcast right as well? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing it stag because Sam's in the states, oh, so he'll be there in spirit, if not in body. Of course, because Sam is based out in the states now. Are you going to project him? Are you going to have him virtually in attendance? Well, I wanted to have him projected like Games Master, but no, I think it's just <laughs> it's just going to be me and guests. Oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. Fair that enough. Made, that's, that's subject to change. I might be able to wrangle him in. But at the moment, that's what the plan is. Amazing. Well, there you go. Well, uh, hopefully lots of people listening to this will be coming to Fright Fest this August. So if you're coming, come along and see some of Dan's movies. Come and see the Arrow podcast. Yeah, come say hi. 
Uh, so, Dan, let's talk about vampires. That's the subgenre yeah. that we're covering this series. First of all, let me ask you, are you a fan of vampire movies? I'm not not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it takes a lot of lifting for me to love a vampire film. Yeah. I think I, I think the sort of bare bones version of the vampire story has never really sat particularly close to my heart. Mm, mm-hmm. um, but I do. I, but I love what it can be. I love what it can offer. There's a there's a lot going on that I really like, and I think that especially as it's moved into sort of the modern space. But um, and by the modern space, I mean post the 30s yes <laughs> i mean i mean yes. do you, film <laughs> post literature um i think that it's found quite popular success with a lot of the bits of the of the of the story that aren't necessarily my the bits i'm interested in at the fore yes and so yes. that it, it's almost like there are two different subgenres that are both about vampires. That's so interesting. Yeah, you're so right about that. And I've definitely found I, I I've sort of found, especially when watching the two films we're going to talk about this week, and even the two films I talked about last week, The Blood Spattered Bride and Daughters of Darkness. I feel like yeah. the movies that are almost not quite vampire movies are the vampires I movies I like more. If that makes yeah. sense, like I, I've spent a lot of time doing the very traditional, all of the Dracula adaptations, some of the Hammer horror films, and yeah. you know they're good for what they are. But I think it's it, it's around this time in the seventies when filmmakers started kind of twisting the tropes and the, the genre a little bit that I think it yeah. it got quite exciting, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, and and that's the thing. I think that you know horror at its heart is an outsider like genre yeah and uh and then all of the subgenres sort of play with different elements of that and weirdly i think that the populist version of vampirism is one of the is one of the least outsidery mm-hmm. because it's b- because you know whether it's uh like the the sort of the the handsome frilly cuffed almost <laughs> um a uh, heathcliffian yeah. <laughs> like vampire character yeah is is a heartthrob in a lot of mm. ways mm-hmm. and that feels anathema to pretty much any other horror antagonist i think you're right i think you're totally right about that and you you can certainly see that with the 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 trends of vampires in the last few decades from kind of buffy to anne rice to twilight obviously and that kind of thing right i mean it's definitely it's almost kind of shifted out of the horror genre in a lot of ways i think hasn't it these last couple of decades yeah it has and i i really enjoyed buffy when i was you know when it first came out, I remember getting a VHS tape sent of, of it sent over from the states before it played here. Amazing, um, or rather, a friend of mine had them sent over, and then he would come around and we'd watch them. Um, and yeah, like I, I really enjoyed all that stuff. And again, that almost feels like that's so so genre bending that that almost doesn't feel like a vampire show in yeah. a lot of ways as well because yeah. it's a monster of the week format and so yeah. you're it's not just vampires you've got all this other amazing stuff and when you think back about your favorite episodes of buffy i'm guaranteeing like 75 percent of them aren't going to be because of the vampires <laughs> yeah you're so right that's so true yeah like it's yeah. the gentleman every it's a, it's the gentleman for pretty much everyone. it's the gentle it's hush it's the musical it's always one of those yeah. other kind of interesting weird ones isn't it yeah you're right but like you say it is populist and it is very it, it feels like it remains popular as a subgenre um what is it about the vampire as a monster do you think that kind of continues to resonate with so many audiences across so many generations well, it's the horniest of the horror horror subgenres <laughs> yes i mean that's absolutely what it is it's the most obviously about sex of all the of all the horror genres yeah yeah you're absolutely right it's the set i mean i've talked about this with a lot of my guests so far but it's certainly the sexiest monster isn't it if you're gonna get killed by a monster you'd rather be bitten by a vampire than you know have your eyes gouged out by a zombie or something you know yeah or like torn apart by a wolfman or yeah yeah. It's for a start, it's the least sort of like mutanty of all of the monsters, with the possible exception of and again, I don't want to get back into this is it horror if it's not supernatural conversation. Um <laughs> <laughs> but um but like serial killer horror yes can can have that oh but he's so charming kind of mm. subtext which i think is what's at play in the vampire myth as well the mm-hmm. it's the ultimate bad boy he's gonna kill you yes <laughs> yes which i which it. again actually i'd be interested to see if there's a sort of a backswing against the old-fashioned type of i mean i guess that's kind of what twilight was like there's a lot of problems with twilight structurally 
mm-hmm. like you know um, I don't mean structurally and I don't mean morally but like a lot of the stuff that's going on is slightly questionable but it's but but it is it is much more about like he's trying to win the he's trying to win her rather than you know glamouring which is basically you know gothic rehypnol yeah yeah <laughs> yes so true gothic rehypnol is an amazing way to put it it's true um yeah you're absolutely right and it's, it's been interesting seeing the ways in which that is kind of even that side of it the kind of consent side of it i suppose is tackled by different filmmakers as as these uh, yeah. as this subgenre has gone on as well yeah um awesome all right well i've i'm really excited to talk about these two movies because i think they both kind of as we'll get into probably do kind of exist on the fringes of this kind of subgenre little bit as well which makes them really interesting so uh let's kick off with let's scare jessica to death from 1971 i'm calling on all the spirits of everyone who's ever died in this house jessica i'm calling on all the spirits of everyone who's ever died in this house jessica paramount pictures presents let's scare jessica to death Uh, Jessica and her husband and their mustachioed friend are moving to the countryside for something of a new start after uh, Jessica is released from uh, a a mental institute uh, for obtuse and veiled reasons. (laughs) Um, And uh, and they they move to this, uh, this... this house that we later find out the uh, the husband has kind of spent all his savings on, um, and there they meet a young woman who has been uh, squatting in this house that she thought was abandoned, uh, and the the movie really that's kind of most of what happens, yeah. um, but it's the it's this very subjective narrative where it's about uh, Jessica's uh, experience. There's a lot of her own voiceover. Um, going on like the voices in her head her own voice Um, and later maybe some other voices and uh, and yeah it's like a sort of ASMR uh, sort of like freak out movie (laughs) It is. It's a perfect way to put it. It's so true. Um, so tell me, first of all, what do you think of this film, Dan? What's your sort of history with this movie and what are your thoughts on it generally? I, I really like it. I don't think I always really liked it. I, mm. I saw it relatively early in my sort of horror watching life. And I think at that time, you know, I'd seen like Fascination and Living Dead Girl and this this wasn't that end of it, you know? Yes. This is a quite an unhorny vampire movie despite yes. uh despite the the sort of the peculiar love triangles again slightly veiled and and undefined um and i think it didn't have quite enough for me and then about 15 maybe slightly more years ago it played at the bfi and i went along with a friend of mine who'd never seen it and we left and i, I really enjoyed it on that repeat that my second watch mm. and he really didn't like it and mm. we sat and discussed it in the pub afterwards and nothing steals your resolve in liking a film like having to defend it oh it's so <laughs> true isn't it you have to go kind of the other way well exactly yeah. but also i think that it meant that i you know i had to really consider it and actually say out loud all the things i liked about it so rather than a lot of films where you go yeah that was great and then it just kind of becomes this fuzz in the back of your mind yeah you know because the thing is it's not it's not it's not a bombastic film. No, not at um, all. No. It's it's very competently photographed. It looks nice. It's got a fantastic soundtrack. Um and but like it's not super gory. It's not wild. It's not even particularly psychedelic. Yeah. Although it, it touches upon it. But there is a really lovely feel to it. And I think a lot of it comes from the recording of the voiceover. Yes. Um and you know, I think even the the, the most recent time I've seen it. This will be the fourth time I just watched it, I think. And I, I, the third time I watched it, I didn't know what ASMR was. But there is lots of, like, whispering next to a microphone. Yes. Small voice voiceover. And it makes the whole thing feel very inside your head. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're totally yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very close film. Not in a claustrophobic way, although a little bit later. Um, but just in a very, like you're very much in there with Jessica for a lot of it. Yeah, you're so right. It's very 
intimate, I suppose, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I've had almost the same kind of experience as you. And I wonder if a lot of people have this with this movie. Like you say, your friend didn't like it. Like... I think it, when it first, when you first see it, I, I certainly found this when I first see it, it wasn't what I expected. And it wasn't what the title, I think, led me to believe this movie was. I don't know. Yeah. With a title like Let's Scare Jessica to Death, I don't know what I had in my head, but I think I had something more akin to a kind of almost silly teen movie or something, you know? And, and. Like pranks or April Fool's yeah, Day. Like, exactly. I think basically in my head it was going to be like April Fool's Day. And, and it, of course, it's not. And like you say, very little happens. It's sort of a mood piece. It's, you know, and, uh, and so the first time I watched it, I was a bit like, oh, okay. That, or, what was that kind of thing? And then watched it a second time, liked it more. I think this was the third time I watched it. And I, I really liked it this time round as well. And, uh, like it's 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 all in the kind of subtleties i think isn't it like you said it's the sound design it's the the sort of the minutiae of the performances as well you know um especially zora lampo who plays jessica i think she's yeah. just incredible i think i sort of appreciated her more and more each time i watched it um yeah and 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 I also i think having watched it straight off the back of watching a lot of these kind of other sort of uh, i guess you'd call it kind of lesbian vampire uh sub genre like uh, movies like daughters of yeah. darkness and the blood spattered bride i think there are some interesting connections there as well with this movie as well so i kind of got that little bit more out of it as well um but it, it is isn't it I think, I think it's a movie that you have to see a kind of cup a, a couple of times to kind of fully grasp what the film's doing almost yeah i think so well, especially as you said because it's so easy to go in with misconceptions because of the title because people talk about it in I think more and more these days in slightly hallowed tones. Yes. Because it has, it's become, it was one of those not particularly well known ones that then became a point of pride to have seen. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but also, it's barely a vampire film. Yeah. Yeah. You're so, right. So, like, you could literally cut one shot out of this movie and it would no longer be a vampire film. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Yeah. In, in many ways. I, I mean, and that's a really interesting thing. That's the next thing I was going to ask you really about that is, is the way in which this movie sort of dabbles in different subgenres almost you know and uh, you know that it feels to me like there are elements of a kind of ghost story and almost turn of the screw type story here there's obviously there's a kind yeah. of psychological horror element too and like you say a little bit of vampire in there but maybe uh, you could almost take or leave the vampire element i think couldn't you well absolutely uh i think it's it's probably more of a ghost story than a vampire story yeah. you know just in as far as screen time, yes, <laughs> for, the different, absolutely. for the different types of shenanigans goes yeah. on. Um, but really, more than anything, it's a it's a paranoia movie. It's a it's a freak out movie, and uh, and it's about uh, a woman dealing with the aftermath of uh, coming out of mental care. Um, she's got quite a surprisingly supportive husband, given the era, especially if you. Uh, choose to assume that they have a, a somewhat open relationship yeah um if they don't then he's a piece of shit obviously <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, true, but true. she but she definitely knows what he's doing and she seems relatively calm about it so whether or not it's been pre-arranged is the only is the only bit of guesswork mm, mm -hmm. um but yeah so it's it's about that like the inter the monologue is is very much about like how she is experiencing the world and about trying to keep hold of control. There's a there's a scene around the dinner table where they're all talking and it keeps on pushing in on her and the audio of the story that's being told on the table suddenly develops like an echo. Yeah. Like she's away from everyone else. Her experience is othered because like through this very good sound design. There was this enormous cake that was terrorizing England. Angel's food or devil's food? <laughs> that was food cake <laughs> and it would ooze into the windows and into the doors and engulf the people it eat everything in its wake it was traveling down the coast from Scotland whenever it would come to a town or a village it would call out here comes the cake here comes the cake so she is feeling away from the group this support network that she's got is feeling like she's feeling distant from it and by the end when people when she starts to make statements and assertions that that people don't believe 
Um, th- then she's being pulled further and further away from her group. She's feeling more and more isolated. Yeah, and then, and then that does very much, like you say, it feels like a trope of the ghost story subgenre as much as it does that kind of psychological horror. And those two tied in together very well, especially in the 1960s with movies like Carnival of Souls or The Innocents or The Haunting, of course, it reminded me of with Nell's kind of internal monologue as well running throughout. It's definitely got elements of all those kind of movies going on in there, I think, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So we've got this kind of potential unreliable narrator, right? But then, uh, so, and it does feel like we're in this kind of haunted house scenario with this first setup, right? Of, you know, there's a seance and we're hearing voices and this kind of thing. Um, but of course, there is this vampire element, right? And actually, what I think is really interesting, again, rewatching it now in the context of this vampire series, I found a lot of connections with Carmilla, the vampire story Carmilla, that this woman appears out of nowhere to potentially disrupt the marriage of our main female character and this woman bears a striking resemblance to this portrait or this photograph of this woman from you know generations ago and this idea that there is this mysterious vampire this mysterious female vampire that is potentially glamouring or seducing our main female protagonist you know yeah i think that that the one shot i alluded to earlier aside the the other elements of it that could be argued as as slightly vampire-y um, are that you could say that maybe Emily is is glamouring Jessica to some extent. Yes. Jessica has a connection to her that she doesn't understand. Um, it doesn't seem to be overtly sexual, um, although Emily is a sexual character. Mm. Um, and and But she does seem to be slightly under her control. So when she is... Uh, like let down by her in the real world in a petty and slightly bullying way and in this fantasy world that may or may not be true we're never, it's never fully presented as one way or the other to mm, us mm-hmm. in in a in a slightly more sinister way it, it, it could either be uh, like a, a hard lesson learnt about trust when you're, once you're outside the walls of the psychiatric hospital, or it could be the culmination of a of an attempt to sort of not sacrifice her, but like you know push her towards this wet spirit. Right, exactly. It, this is what's so clever about this film, right? Is that you can read every scene in sort of multiple ways. And yeah, like that that moment um, um, you're talking about, right, is where Jessica and Emily are on the pier together. And Emily is, I think, rubbing some cream in Jessica's back. And, you know, I think Jessica is clearly kind of uncomfortable with it. But is she actually enjoying it? Um, and is she uncomfortable with the fact that she's enjoying it? And she sort of just goes, great. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's that's, that's that's very good. Thank you. But then suddenly things take potentially a sinister turn when Emily pushes her in the lake, right? Oh. Again, is this just playful? Is it flirty? Is it actually malicious? Is she trying to drown Jessica when she dunks her head? Or again, is it just playing? And the way that both actresses play it and the way that Jessica reacts to it is... I just think it's so... Everything about this movie is so rich, isn't it? I I feel like you are kind of... You're feeling a certain way and you're thinking certain things when they are actually doing very little, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's considering how little it says... It says a lot, like it. Yeah, it, it it imparts a lot of information without saying a lot of stuff. Exactly, and so there is this kind of hint of: is there some sort of repressed sexuality here? Is Jessica wanting to get rid of her husband, be with this woman? We don't quite know the ins and outs of it. Um, how do you find the dynamic between Jessica and Duncan and her husband? Right, because uh, you know the when we first meet our three protagonists, Jessica, Duncan, and Woody, right? They're kind of extra friend that is for some reason moving in with them you do get the feeling they're kind of hippies right and it and it also uh, that's the other thing that it, it feels like this film is kind of lightly 
uh, commenting on hippie culture here and maybe the death of hippie culture in the early 70s. But but what do you make generally of the, these kind of main characters that we meet at the beginning of the film and, and their dynamic? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Duncan's pretty sympathetic. There's a nice psych out at the beginning where she sees someone, but the camera's at the top of the stairs looking down at her. They've just arrived at the house. Um, and someone rushes past camera, which is, you know, nowadays quite a, a standard horror gag. Yeah. Um, and she she says, oh, there's someone here, there's someone here. And we as film audiences, particularly film audiences now, are totally ready for everyone to, you know, just brush her off and be like, ah, you're crazy. <laughs> you, just come out of the, you just come out of the booby hatch. Yeah. But, um, but they, they're like, oh, yeah, no, I saw it too. Mm. And... And that kind of wrong foots the audience in quite a wholesome way. It does, yeah. Where you're like, oh, okay, he's actually supporting supporting her. Like, they're making a go of this. It is odd that their friend is moving into this house with them, especially seeing as he's not... I mean, he does sort of have paint on his overalls later, so maybe he's just there for his handyman <laughs> cred. Yeah. But but also, like, there's there's something... I, I feel like there's something going on in that relationship. There's... There's a love triangle or something. Totally. Well, I, that's the thing. It does feel, and like you say, particularly when Emily is brought in as well, it it does feel like they are all existing in some sort of open polyamorous type situation. I think, doesn't it? In in a way, and you know, there are yeah. there are deliberate choices they make, like when all of them are, I think, in the lake together, and they all have to like rub soap into each other, and it's like Duncan pairs with with Emily for that and Jessica pairs with Woody for that as well and it's like yeah. they're all very much kind of just like mucking in and, and being with whoever at any given point right and uh, Jessica seems kind of happy with the fact that Duncan fancies Emily or wants Emily you know or at least doesn't seem that phased by it so we have this kind of one sort of slightly alternative I suppose lifestyle going on with these four characters but then the town they've moved to seems to be the opposite, right? It's full of these old white men who seem to kind of be judging our group of main characters. It's got that kind of folk horror or exploitation vibe, doesn't it? Where, uh, again, this this is another trope that this movie tackles. It, you know, an early example of it, but it sort of feels like a, a bit of a Cabin in the Woods movie or a bit of a exploitation movie where the locals don't like them. But there is this feeling that all of these old locals do not like these these weird hippies moving into their town you know yeah absolutely i was talking to tim coleman uh, about japanese horror on his podcast recently yeah. um and talking about the uh the difference between east and west specifically uh american and english versus well european and american mm. um horror cinema versus japanese cinema um and i was saying that we were colonizers quote-unquote adventurers quote-unquote merchants pushing out into foreign la- foreign lands going and like making our putting ourselves where we weren't wanted yeah and our horror off the back of that culturally is very much about going somewhere and being not not welcome B- finding uh, a place that is un that doesn't want us there that we have put ourselves in mm. whereas japan which was an isolationist nation didn't want europeans coming in at one point illegalized christianity and banned the portuguese and and just tried to kick all the europeans out their horror is much more traditionally about uh the other coming into your space whether it's a girl through a telly um you know but so theirs is a much more invaded horror, and ours is an unwelcome invader horror. Um, and I think that there's that's at play in this, like you know, whether it's the cabin in the woods or you know, whatever. Yeah, this is another example of these people turn up somewhere, and the people who are already there don't want them. Yeah, obviously, that's going to be an indelible part of the American creative cycle. Yeah, God, that's such a that's such an interesting point. Yeah, you're so right about that. Um, so it's interesting, isn't it? There's all these different little dynamics at play, and I think that's what kind of certainly for me kind of throws you off at the beginning because you kind of go, "Where is this going?" You know, and then of course it does end up being this kind of vampire story. But but what kind of vampires do we get here in this film? The, the, these aren't your typical kind of like fanged monsters that bite you and suck your blood, are they? Well, so the the, the shot I mentioned earlier that you could cut out is the one bite that you see. Yeah. Um, but there are no fangs. 
and you cut away before you see any blood. And then later, you kind of see wounds or scars on people that maybe indicate that they've previously been bitten or turned in some way. But they're not even all on the neck. They're definitely not bite. They're definitely not fang marks. They mostly look like knife knife scars. They do. Um, and one is on the inside of someone's arm. Yes. So. So yeah, I mean, it's if they are vampires, there's every possibility that they're not supernatural vampires. That that they don't have fangs, that they're just drawing blood from one another, almost maybe more like a cult. Yeah. So the 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 the, the main question about this film, I think, that people ask is, is what we're seeing happening, or or is it all in Jessica's mind? Yeah. And I'm very much on the fence because I like both readings of it. Um, having it be that she, like, especially with the very end, that she uh, ultimately pushes away like destroys her own support network in those last moments Mm -hmm. um but but then the other version is makes a lot of sense because it's such an amalgam of horror tropes it has that little bit of vampire it has that little bit of ghost it has that little bit of you know uh unwelcoming village all of these things are kind of little little seasonings of them in this movie about a woman dealing with a slow mental breakdown yeah um and 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 the circular visually and and you know the the way it comes back to where it started is so nice mm-hmm. because that plays into the idea that before the film she's in a an asylum she's in a a place for people who can't live in the world yeah. and by the end of the film she's definitely gone mad again yeah uh, yeah, I completely agree. I, I'm I'm on the fence as well, but I do love I love both readings in that re- in that regard. And yeah, like there, there's also even a little bit of slasher in there. I think isn't there? There's almost a bit of kind of a yeah. bay of blood or Friday the Thirteenth. Like there's even a moment towards the end when Duncan sort of comes, his body sort of comes out of the lake and everything as well. You know, it's like it's really it's amazing how much is 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 kind of in this movie that also at the same time feels relatively simple and restrained. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, those low angle close up shots of uh of emily coming to the bed with the big knife yeah a very uh sort of somewhere between barbara and herschel gordon lewis yeah (laughs) yeah it's so true and actually let me ask you about just generally the way this movie kind of looks and sounds then as well you know jan john hancock's direction what do you think of kind of the way this story is brought to life visually i yeah I, i think it's really nice like it starts off with that very uh familiar dreamy 70s uh i'm guessing it's 16 mil um aesthetic it's very um it's sort of very blown out and soft lots of like warm sunset colors it's really nice Mm. and a lot of it's quite wide and it's not very showy they sort of put the camera down and let people get on with their stuff but then as the film moves on you get closer to stuff close up start creeping in first with jessica and and like showing us that her she's feeling isolated by having everyone else cut out of the frame Mm. we get in nice and close to her we have those shifts in the audio design to show that she's feeling alone and then by the end you've got those sort of like very wide angle lenses pushed right up into the villagers faces that you you know you get these the crowding around scenes which again feels very much like those those sort of early um like early 60s late 50s horror shots with uh with early zombies almost where they're all crowding in but they only had like six guys yes. so yeah. they just got like a like a 25 mil lens and just put everyone really close to it <laughs> yeah but it but it but it makes for a really nice progression through the film the the aesthetic changes with Jessica's like ability to hold on to reality I know I love it too and like you say that sound design right as well the 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 constant kind of whispering and the music right I mean the sound I guess does a huge amount um it does a huge amount of work to bringing the horror to this movie Yeah, yeah, it's whispering horror. It's like gentle folk music meets carpenter suit. Yes. <laughs> throughout. <laughs> yeah. Like these sort of stabbing, discordant noises and then some really lovely kind of like... Uh I'm trying to think of a a folky a folky band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is it is folky at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I think all of that kind of creates such a. Um, it tells the story more than the actual narrative tells the story. I think with this film, you know, a lot of the time. Um, uh, yeah, and let me go back to. I just want to ask you again about the character of Jessica then, and and Zora Lampert's performance as well. I mean, 
do you obviously like you said it's all very kind of they don't really lay out exactly what has happened to Jessica or what is wrong with Jessica do you have any kind of read in your head of what's going on with Jessica like at the start of this movie or what she's been through or anything like that no I think it's deliberately quite oblique um they're you know they, they they don't even refer to it that much um and they certainly never refer to it with any specificity i think her performance is fantastic because she so often looks unsure of herself yeah she so often looks slightly confused and some of that's in the editing which is also very uh, very proficient there's that bit at the end when she um or towards the end when she gets the ride into town and she manages to stop the the driver mm. and her her interaction with him is so broken is so disjointed because she's whether it's because she's masking or whether it's because she genuinely is like having a fracture um but the performance is fantastic so good isn't it and i love these little moments where it just feels so real to me these moments where clearly she's been through something and she it's like she doesn't want anyone to know that she's not fully recovered, right? And she she doesn't want to cause a fuss. So there's this constant feeling that she is in a panic, but she's trying to kind of keep it, uh, sort of keep keep tabs on it or kind of keep it secret. And there's a lot of her kind of being like, I'm fine, everything's fine, you know? And it's like, you know that she isn't. And she does a hell of a lot, I think, just with her eyes and her face, you know, um, throughout. It's so, it's such a, it's a beautiful, it's, it's quite, I find it quite a moving performance in a lot of ways, you know? I kind of really feel for her throughout, especially as it goes on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. She's got a, she's, she's got a very uh, sort of sympathetic look of, I'm not quite in control. <laughs> Leave me alone, please. Please leave me alone. Get away. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. Are you all right? Please. I was just playing. That's all right. That's all right. Yes. I'm so Thank sorry. You. you okay? No, that's all right. I think what's interesting as well is the way in which people have talked about this film as being so terrifying, right? I mean, the Chicago Film Critics Association in 2006 put this as number 87 in their 100 scariest films ever made. Uh, Rod Serling from The Twilight Zone supposedly called this one of the most frightening films he'd ever seen in his life. I, I do think that's kind of interesting with this film. Do you do you think this film is scary? Did it scare you in that way? Uh, I think it's unsettling occasionally mm-hmm. um and it's absorbing yeah but i don't think it's horrifying yeah i would agree with you uh i think it's unsettling for sure and there's something about it that is quite upsetting as well like i say it from an a uh, from an emotional empathetic standpoint your heart kind of goes out to jessica and um i just kind of want to keep jessica safe and i think in that regard it is quite an unsettling uncomfortable watch at times but none of it really scared me in that sort of traditional horror way there's certainly nothing that would keep me up at night from this film but uh, but it is it does have a really unique atmosphere i think which i really loved So finally then, what do you think of the way this film ends? You know, we've got all of this mad stuff with her getting attacked in the bed by her husband, who's now a vampire, I guess. Then it turns out that everyone in the town has been turned into a vampire. So they were all wearing bandages, weren't they, all of the locals? Turns out they were hiding wounds, like you say, not all on their necks. Some of them were on their arms, so they are kind of vampires but maybe not um and we've got this kind of chase we've got that great moment where she discovers woody's corpse on the tractor you know again it kind of feels like the last act of a slasher movie at this point right this is long before friday the 13th but that idea of our final girl kind of discovering all these bodies and escaping on a rowing boat on the lake right and then a hand reaches out from the water it turns out to be duncan uh, and all of the townspeople just kind of stand there and watch her as she floats away. It's again, it's a kind of um, it doesn't really give us a whole lot of closure necessarily. It doesn't explain a whole lot. But how do you find that ending? Is it satisfying for you? Yeah, again, I think probably not the first time just because I want probably wanted more gore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but actually, it's it's really nice. The little bit of voiceover, very short credits, lovely photography on the boat. 
it's mm. yeah it's it is very nice it, it is i think when you're when you're watching it on its terms it's very satisfying yeah um and they go so finally how do you think this film holds up you know it's like it's over 50 years old now which is insane really isn't it but yeah how, yeah, how do crazy. you th- how do you think this film holds up watching it now in 2022 um it's in some ways I think it's probably better to watch it now because it has the weight of a of an era that we're aesthetically familiar with and people searching out a slightly obscure maybe vampire movie from the 70s the early 70s are going to be quite open to this kind of thing yeah yeah um but but then obviously mainstream tastes I think a lot of like if someone just stumbled across this now there's a you know statistically quite high chance that they wouldn't enjoy it mm. um you know it's certainly not a not a film for the Marvel generation no although like there is something about it i thought that, th- that made me think okay maybe it wouldn't have mainstream appeal now but it does sort of resemble a kind of what people now call elevated horror right these kind of horror movies that we've got a lot of recently that are slightly slower paced slightly more oblique slightly more character based psychological um they're very popular right now i think this idea of this woman has been through something and then is it manifesting you know is this a mental health horror film or is it a monster is it a vampire uh so i think all of that is really interesting but but overall just for a movie that is l- over 50 years old i think it holds up phenomenally well yeah yeah, yeah. And, and as i mentioned before i think the, the husband's like its depiction of mental illness is surprisingly sympathetic for the era yeah the husband yeah. is a surprisingly sympathetic character considering that um so it's you know it, it it hasn't it hasn't it's not one of those films from that era that now feels difficult no absolutely uh well there we go before we move on to the next movie we are going to head over to this week's uh, edition of wild about horror because of course with a film like this freudian cinephile mary wild has plenty of thoughts on let's scare jessica to death <laughs> Hey Mike, Mary Wilde calling with some thoughts on John Hancock's indie horror flick Let's Scare Jessica to Death about a mentally fragile woman who comes to believe that the mysterious drifter she's led into her home might actually be a vampire. It's inspired by Henry James's novella The Turn of the Screw and Robert Wise's 1963 film The Haunting. Hancock wanted to represent a protagonist whose credibility interpreting events could be questioned by the audience. Some film scholars have compared Let's Scare Jessica to Death to Sheridan Le Fanu's 1871 novel, Carmilla. Jessica has been released from an inpatient psychiatric treatment center. Her husband, Duncan, has given up his career as a string bassist for the New York Philharmonic to look after her. They're moving to a rundown farmhouse outside the city. When the couple and their hippie friend Woody arrive at the house, they're surprised to find a squatter, Emily, already there. She thought the property was abandoned. When Emily offers to leave, Jessica invites her to stay the night. We come to understand that Jessica hears voices, believes that a woman is following her, and sees someone under the water while swimming in the cove. She's afraid to talk about these perceptions with Duncan and Woody, for fear they'll think her mental health is declining again. She's also aware that her husband is attracted to Emily, and that the men in the nearby town, all of whom bandaged in some way, are hostile towards the newcomers. Duncan and Jessica need money, so they decide to sell old items found in the house, one of which is a framed portrait of the former owners, the Bishop family, father, mother, and daughter Abigail. The local antique dealer informs them that Abigail drowned prior to her wedding day in 1880 in the cove behind their house. Her body was never found, and legend has it she's still alive, roaming the countryside as a vampire. Later, Jessica realizes that in the portrait of the Bishop family, Abigail bears a striking resemblance to Emily. The connection between Emily and Abigail is sealed. Turns out, the New Yorker's eccentric new friend 
wasn't trespassing at the farmhouse. They're the ones who invaded her space. And now they're making a living out of repurposing objects from her past. Abigail might be the vampire, but they are rummaging through her personal items, unceremoniously flogging them for quick cash, and draining her house of invaluable historical significance. I like the way this film flips the script on vampirism. We see how it is really a type of energy, and both villains and victims can embody the essence of it at different times. There are many subtle hints that contribute powerfully to the overall emotional texture of the story. Jessica's hobby of tombstone rubbing, for instance, seems to exist tangentially in the plot, but I think it accesses something deeper and very influential that nevertheless remains unspoken. We see Jessica reproducing a headstone inscription by grazing charcoal across the paper held against the stone. This practice can be done to obtain a memento after a cemetery visit, but most commonly provides a reference for historical or genealogical research. Jessica feels compelled to preserve an aspect of the past, a dimension that has ostensibly died, yet some part of it lingers on. She sort of exists within this paradox. Perhaps studying headstone engravings offers her a reassuring clue about the mystery of death. The tracing paper is flimsy, but it captures something literally etched in stone. Touches of death pervade this movie. Instead of a regular car or truck, Duncan drives a hearse, apparently because he can fit his gigantic string bass in the back. The instrument's bulky case even looks like a gothic coffin. These optics associated with Duncan's line of work communicate something crucial, that being forced to sacrifice his prestigious music career has sucked the mojo out of him. What was once an animating force is now a lifeless relic of happier times. At one point, Jessica reaches to pick an apple in the orchard, but Duncan warns her that it's poisoned. Shades of Eve here in the Garden of Eden having the impulse to bite the forbidden fruit of the Tree of Knowledge. This is the biblical perception of the fall of man, that the woman disobeyed God's orders and all of humanity is punished as a direct result of female insubordination. I read this as Jessica daring to access prohibited supernatural knowledge as a feature of her psychosis, something that attracts her husband's aggressive blame and resentment. Duncan repeatedly downplays and disparages Jessica's feelings, precisely because he thinks that her illness depletes him of career, social status, and financial security. Duncan questioning Jessica's perceptions creates a curiously confusing effect, not unlike the ambiguity permeating the film Rosemary's Baby. In some scenes, it's evident that there is severe gaslighting and manipulation by the husband, but at other times, we feel almost certain that the wife is delusional. The uncertainty only intensifies the horror element. The film is bookended by this exasperating sentiment in which Jessica is shown in a boat, thinking privately, I sit here and I can't believe that it happened, and yet I have to believe it. Dreams or nightmares? Madness or sanity? I don't know which is which. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that Jessica is psychotic, responding to overwhelming stress and perceived danger in her environment. In this scenario, her sense of self is crumbling, and I would suggest that the auditory hallucinations are a desperate attempt at holding herself together in whatever way she can. She appears to be constantly invaded by a foreign entity, a relentless voice that bursts from inside and presents a threat to the construction of her identity. Jacques Lacan introduced the concept of foreclosure to identify the specific cause for psychosis regarding facts that the subject no longer sees as part of reality. 
A dimension is rejected outside the commonly accepted order, as if it never existed at all. And this usually happens when a paternal function fails. We know that Jessica's father passed away. Within psychoanalysis, when this lawful component is foreclosed, it leaves a hole in the discourse that can never be filled, causing a psychotic structure in the individual. Something like this would, in theory, rip apart the fabric of Jessica's reality. No meaningful symbolic sense can be made now. Incidentally, the deterioration of the 1960s counterculture has been cited as a theme of this film by observers. The hearse that Duncan and Jessica drive, which has the word love spray-painted on it, has been noted as an allusion to the death of hippie values. Critic and biographer Michael Doyle describes the film as a haunting elegy for the failures of the hippie movement. He elaborates that the film isolates and illuminates the death and corruption of counterculture values from the era and anticipates the festering paranoia that occurred throughout the 1970s with the Watergate scandal, the assassinations of Harvey Milk and George Moscone, and the Jonestown Massacre. Director John Hancock, though unclear about whether it was consciously or unconsciously integrated into the screenplay, has granted this interpretation, commenting, quote, You could already feel that negativity brewing when we were making Let's Scare Jessica to Death. The things weren't working out the way some of us had hoped and dreamed they would. End quote. There is a pervading notion of the city slickers as wandering spirits, characters who drift in and out of situations, non-committal, homeless, floundering. What is striking is that something horrible occurred in the past, causing Jessica to be hospitalized, but the source of her troubles is never openly talked about. It's possible that unresolved grief following the loss of her father is the cause of her suffering, but that's never confirmed. She peers haunted, smiling through her tears. Perhaps this is the reason why Jessica can sense a ghostly presence in the house during Emily's seance. She is able to connect to the spirit of the former occupants precisely because... There, too, lingers an unspecified trauma that prevents the family from having closure. We know that Abigail died young, but what were the circumstances of the tragedy? This is what Jessica and the bishops have in common. They remain bonded in an unknowable, undead heartbreak. Until next time... A big thank you to the wonderful Mary Wilde. And don't forget, if you want to hear more of Mary's takes on films, on horror cinema and more, you can listen to her podcast. That's the Projections podcast, which she co-hosts with Sarah Cleaver. Or you can support her on Patreon. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Mary Wilde. Hello, everybody. Just interrupting this week's episode momentarily to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscriber Ian Thompson. Uh, Ian sent me a little message and said the following. Hello there, horror enthusiasts. It's your favorite EOH sponsor, Casket Clap. First and most importantly, I would like to thank you, Mr. Munzer, for putting together such a wonderful podcast. I never grow tired of hearing horror movies dissected and discussed by such top-notch human beings. EOH is an absolute banger of a program and a blessing straight from hell or horror movie heaven whichever sounds better very quickly i'll go ahead and plug my online store grape station grape station specializes in a wide variety of collectibles funko pops bear bricks vinyl lps comics cassettes as well as tons of horror related items from movies featured on this very podcast u.s customers please visit grapestation.shop for your collectible needs international customers can pay casketclap.com a 
visit if you so desire. All items are packed with extreme care and ship the same or next day with tracking. In addition to Grape Station, I also run a record label called Cricket Cemetery. The label was established in Arlington, VA in 2010 and currently at 50 vinyl releases and counting. There's an obvious focus to metal, grindcore, hardcore and punk, but I believe there's something there for everyone. So if you'd like to listen to some new music or pick up a record, please visit cricketcemetery.com. Two bands on the label, Bandit and Jarhead Fertilizer, are now on tour, so be sure to go see them or give them a listen. Thank you so much, Mike. Please take care and happy horror watching. Ah, oh, thank you so much to uh, Casket Clap, aka Ian Thompson, for that lovely message. Um, you're a very busy man, Ian, by the sounds of it. So you are running your own online store where you can get all those cool Funko Pops, etc. Grape Station, uh, and you also run a record label, and you've got two bands on tour. This is. Uh, yeah, I don't know how you find time. I only do a podcast these days and I barely find time to get everything done. Um, but one more time, a huge thank you to you, Ian, for being this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscriber Ian Thompson, aka Casket Clap. Uh, and if you want to become an Evolution of Horror sponsor just like Ian and get your own little dedicated segment on an episode just like this one, then you simply need to sign up to our Patreon at a $20 level. Head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That was a little clip you just heard there from one of my very favourite horror movies of all time, An American Werewolf in London from 1981. And the reason I'm playing that clip is a little teaser of what we've got happening over on Patreon uh, in the next few weeks. Because that uh, film contains one of the most popular choices in this year's summer poll in which we count down the top 50 horror movie monsters of all time. Uh, Every year over on Patreon, Patreon, we do a big uh, poll in which I ask all patrons of all tiers to send in their top 10s. The first year, it was your top 10 scariest moments. The second year, it was your top 10 horror movies of all time. This year, it was your top 10 horror monsters. And monsters can be read as literally anything, not just beasts like werewolves. It could also be Bruce the Shark from Jaws. It could also be Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. So humans also count as monsters. Essentially, what we're looking for here are horror movie antagonists. Uh, So I asked everyone, and I think over 700 patrons, sent me their top 10 lists for their greatest horror monsters. And I am currently collating the results. The results are fascinating. And in the next couple of weeks over on Patreon, we will be counting down the top 50 horror movie monsters as voted for by you. And that countdown is going to spread across two separate episodes. So uh, cannot wait to get stuck into that that's going to be available for five dollar donors so if you want to get involved simply sign up to our patreon patreon.com slash evolution of horror loads of good stuff to cover in the month of august of course we are going to be covering jordan peele's nope when that is out in uk cinemas and we're also going to be covering fright fest because fright fest will be at the end of august so as ever me and louise blaine will also be joined by becky dark and brad hansen will be giving you daily updates and reviews of everything we see the best and the worst at this year's Fright Fest. And don't forget, if you're heading to Fright Fest this year, if you happen to be in London or within reach of London, please come and say hello to us, me and Becky and Brad and uh, Louise and Adam Robinson and Rob Watts and a whole bunch of other friends of the pod will all be there for the whole five days. So you can find us either in the cinema or in the pub round the corner. Um, And we love meeting you guys. We love meeting listeners of the podcast. So if you're coming to Fright Fest this year, please do come along and say hello. And if you're not coming to Fright Fest, and if you're umming and ahhing overgoing, I believe there are still weekend passes and day passes available. So what are you waiting for? Get involved. Uh, But anyway, if you want to check out all of our Fright Fest coverage, that will be uh, all on Patreon. So patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. 
Okay, let's return to the second half of this week's episode in which me and my guest Dan Martin discuss one of George Romero's most brilliant and underrated movies, Martin from 1977. My name is Martin. I'm 84 years old. People think I'm crazy when I tell them how old I am. I'd like to be normal. I just have a sickness. The only way I can survive is by drinking blood. It's not easy living the way I do. I have to be careful all the time. But I'm pretty good at it. I think as I get older, I get better. I haven't been caught yet. Martin, another kind of terror. You see, people don't understand what's wrong. They think that I'm a monster. They think I'm a vampire. Martin follows the titular character on a train ride to the big city. Um, On said train ride, he commits a murder (laughs) Um, and then meets an old man who we assume is a grandfather or an uncle, but refers to him as cousin um, and uh, also refers to him as Nosferatu. Mm. Uh, After this vampire adjacent murder on the train, which is... Quite chilling. Yes. Um, And what we quickly realise is that if either both of them think Martin is a vampire or, more realistically, just the old man (laughs) thinks Martin is a vampire, and what follows is a sort of ideological battle between the two of them around what's going on. But the the old cousin lays his uh, stall out pretty early on uh, and says Nosferatu, vampire. Yeah. First, I will save your soul. Then I will destroy you. <laughs> yeah. So you know he he he's, he he tells you right up front what he's about, like what his plan is. And he says, if you if you kill anyone in the town and I find out about it, I'll destroy you without saving your soul. Like that's it. You're not allowed to kill anyone. Those are the rules. And you're also going to work in my shop. Yeah. Um. So what do you think of this film, Dan? It's my favourite vampire film. Hey, I love that. I love that. And Absolutely, hands down. It's your favourite vampire film, and yet, is it a vampire film, Dan? I mean, are any of my favourite vampire films <laughs> vampire films? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is fucking great, isn't it? I This was only the second time I'd seen it, and um, I forgot how good it is, and so also good. how chilling it is. Like... I just want to start at the beginning, really, and talk about that train sequence, because that is a genuinely upsetting scene, isn't it? And that is the sort of thing that you don't necessarily expect to see, I don't think, in a vampire film, you know, in in, in a kind of like, I don't know, big gothic kind of, you know, almost romantic kind of vampire film, right? And this movie from the start really kind of subverts that doesn't it and kind of goes like this is not your typical vampire story i suppose yeah absolutely don't scream don't scream scream. so this is very much either a vampire film or a serial killer film yes um and it's like it was made in the 70s in the mid to late 70s it is the 70s was the era of the serial killer in pop uh, pop culture in yeah. america yeah like there were more serial killers being reported on more serial killers being gotten um i did a read of serial killers who were either active in the newspapers or had recently been caught at the time that this was made oh really um and i realized who this is based on oh wow who's it based on it's based on vaughn greenwood who was called right. the Skid Row Slasher. He was active from 64 to 75, um, although most of his killings took place in the last year or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, he killed homeless people, right. um, but he would cut their throats and drink their blood. Wow. And he would leave like circles of salt around them or glasses with their blood like arranged around their body. Um, oh and God. he was arrested in February 1975. 
So that my money is on that being a very strong influence on this film. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're right. It's just as much a serial killer film, this, as it is a vampire film. And what's really clever about it as well is that it is also very much playing with those vampire movie tropes at the same time, isn't it? You know, it almost feels like one of those, you know... I don't know, like a almost almost a kind of scream esque kind of story where you've got like somebody who is maybe almost like imagining themselves in their own movie, in their own horror movie or something, with those amazing little black and white cutaways to kind of what look like yeah. more traditional vampire movies, you know? Yeah, they're incredible. I mean, that's obviously Martin's romanticized idea of what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, because he like it, it, the first time you see that is on the train, and you see him like burst in in black, like he gets to the door. He bursts in in black and white. She kind of swoons, um, and it's all quite vampire-y. Uh, and then it cuts to the colour reality of what's going on with him, like, dropping things and her struggling and him, like, really pathetically saying, like, I don't, it's not going to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. Yeah. Like, it's so unbelievably fucking creepy. Yes. It's so uncomfortable. Um, and I was... Uh, like it, it sets up like it's going to be a sexual assault, which is super, super uncomfortable to watch. And then it subverts that with the razor blade, mm-hmm. which is, you know, very, very simple, but very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apparently, Romero wanted to shoot the entire movie in black and white. Interesting. Uh, and the producers said no, which I think is the best decision a producer could have made on this job because that juxtaposition between those things is so powerful because of the black and white yeah i completely agree i completely agree um yeah so romero i mean like i i feel as though this movie is not talked about as much as other romero films right but but how does it rank for you in kind of romero's you know filmography and and why isn't this movie as beloved as night of the living dead or dawn of the dead for example well, it's interesting i mean dawn of the dead is is as uh, sorry uh, night of the living dead is so important in film history that it can't not be discussed. Yeah. But it's very dark. It's dark in the way that a lot of Romero's other films aren't dark. Like, you know, your Monkey Shines and your Knight Riders, and, like, there's a bit of lightness to these films. Night of the Living Dead, it's not as dark as Martin. Martin is his darkest film. (laughs) But it's it's on that direction. I think the film it's aesthetically the closest to is Season of the Witch. Yes. Um... Which it which it has a very like obviously it's canonically very close to it as well in his in his career, mm-hmm. but it's but aesthetically it looks the color sequences look a lot like it. Yeah, it's always um, got a kind of like sort of kitchen sinky kind of look, hasn't it? Or something. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's al- almost uh, sort of verite esque. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. Which again goes so well to juxtapose it with the the sort of fantasy sequences about like how his life's going to be, and especially yeah. and I won't. It be too explicit just yet in case anyone's listening without having watched it but especially that like staccato ending oh my god yeah yeah when it's just like like a rug pull mm-hmm. oh so yeah. good yeah yeah it's it's tremendous isn't it and you're right about that like i think i think i come to a romero film with the expectations that it is going to be a little bit more on the sort of light and fun side and of course you're right like night of the living dead is incredibly dark really and this movie does it does feel tonally more akin to that i i think in a lot of ways you know because it really like you say from that opening scene when you think you're about to witness a, a, a sexual assault and it's very uncomfortable it kind of it kind of sort of sustains that tone and mood all the way throughout even though what we're seeing is is quite wacky at times almost you know yeah it's well it's very matter of fact in those in the killing sequences like he's he's very human and it's not he's not clumsy in the way that the scream killers are clumsy like this isn't kicking the kicking the killer in the balls and getting away no this is it feels more realistic because he is painted in a very human way and as a result it has the same tone as things like angst and henry portrait of a serial killer and yep. like those serial killer biopics which where you do feel so like almost complicit because you're yeah. it almost feels like you're hanging around to see it yes like you're waiting in the wings of this appalling act um let's talk about martin then and his family and this whole idea of him as a vampire so 
His grand, it's his grandfather, isn't it? Is it his grandfather who he stays with? They 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 call it they call each other cousin. Oh, that's right, cousin. Yeah, that's even because weirder. well, but because Martin says that he's in his eighties. Yes, oh, of course, that's right. Yeah, because this is all part of the is he a vampire or isn't he? The so, game. so exactly. So Martin thinks he's, I think, an eighty-four-year-old vampire, right? And then you've got yeah. this 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 actual old guy who may or may not be his cousin, who also thinks that he is a vampire. What is what is the deal here? Has it been that? Is it some sort of childhood trauma? Like he's been brought up to believe this is the case? Is it actually the case? Like what? What? How do you kind of read this whole scenario in this family? Well, old cousin says. Uh like alludes to two or three other vampires in the family history yes yes almost as though and and there's no indication that you become a vampire when you get bitten by a vampire that aspect of the element is gone obviously he's walking around in sunlight yeah not that that's unheard of in vampire films but obviously it's it's unusual um but the in- implication seems to be almost like it's a mutation or a curse mm, rather mm-hmm. than anything else. If he says it's happened to the family before, he recognises it. There's all there's talk about like the home country, which is pr- presumably Eastern Europe. Um, yeah, and but but it's all based around religion as well. You know, I'll save your soul and then I'll destroy you. So like, some some reads of it could be about uh, like religious rationale for things that can't be explained mm-hmm. like just turning to religion when you don't understand something it's really it, I, and i love the way that actually you know especially pairing these two films together while let's get jessica to death definitely had a kind of carmilla vibes at times this very much feels like it has dracula vibes of course and you know that cousin really feeling like a kind of van helsing type of character right even down to the accent and the way he looks and everything um but i do think it's really interesting about like you say Uh, the thing that is really interesting and kind of confusing about it is that martin thinks he is a vampire but also not to the extent that his cousin thinks that he's a vampire right because he says look there's no such thing as magic look that cross doesn't affect me the holy water the garlic doesn't affect me or whatever like he knows that certain elements of this are bullshit right but then also he does still think he's a vampire well i don't know if he thinks he's what we call a vampire I think he's referring to himself as a vampire because of what he does. But like how how much of the vampire myth do you strip away before it's just some dude drinking blood? Right, exactly because actually we don't oh, we see him with fangs towards the end, don't we? But but they're plastic, they're joke shop fangs. He oh, that's pushed, right. They're joke shop. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Cuz yeah, we don't see him that's with it. fangs. That's he's 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 aping it. He 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 basically pranks his cousin. <laughs> That's right, yeah, when he's wearing the cape and the fangs, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he doesn't, like, exactly, you're right. It, it's like, what extent, what what makes you a vampire compared to just a person that enjoys drinking blood, I suppose, is interesting, isn't it? Because, and again, it's kind of the same with Let's Scare Jessica to Death, really, apart from maybe that one shot where you see somebody bite somebody, a lot of the wounds look like they were inflicted by a knife, maybe, or whatever. And and it's the same with this, isn't it? He is... He's not biting them. He's slashing them with razor blades. Then he's drinking their blood. But other than that, he's just a normal teenage boy. Although one that thinks he's an eight, an eighty-four year old man. So like, it's it's a very strange thing. Yeah, absolutely. I am your cousin. I am your cousin Martin. You see. You see. You see. You see, it isn't magic. Even I know that. There's there's two two films that it reminds me of very specifically. There's a French art house comedy horror vampire film from 1971 called The Sadist Has Red Teeth. Right. Directed by Jean-Louis Van Bell. Um, and it's about a young man who is bored, so decides he will be a vampire. And and when he drinks blood for the first time, he realizes that actually he is a vampire. He has been a vampire all along, <laughs> <laughs> and it. But but he hadn't realized until he tasted blood. Right. And there's it's like the sort of the light hearted, very peculiar, <laughs> side like cousin to Martin. Yeah. And then you've got uh, Mosquito the Rapist, aka Bloodlust from 1976, which is the only. Uh, which is directed by uh, Marianne Vajda, um, mm-hmm. which is about a guy who builds a special glass pipe 
like a straw that splits in two so that when he drinks the blood, it leaves two perfect fang holes. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> and, he, and, and for the bulk of the movie, he's satisfying himself by drinking the blood of corpses from a, a mortuary that he's got access to. And it's only later in the movie that he turns his attention towards living, living women. Um, mm. But yeah, he sort of drains them of blood through these two holes that look very much like a traditional vampire uh, vampire bite, but it's just a glass, a little glass straw that he's got. Oh my god, amazing! Yeah, the, and this is a really fascinating thing. I do, I do love this about it. This, this idea that both these movies, but particularly this one, I think you, you know, you can of course read this film as entirely non supernatural in any way, right? Yeah, there's and- there's n- nothing on screen that we see at any point in the film is supernatural. Yeah, we have the older cousin asserting that he is a vampire that he is supernatural and we have him quite routinely demonstrating that a lot of the sort of jiggery pokery that goes along with the the mystical side of it doesn't work he attends half of some sort of exorcism towards the end he demonstrates at length that you know various uh things that normally affect vampires don't have any effect on him whether it's garlic or crosses or holy water or whatever yeah and it's not not until the end that we find out that there is one thing that kill that you know that affects vampires that very much affects him in the same way but that's because it would anyone yeah yeah exactly uh, yeah that's that doesn't prove God. anything <laughs> and that that ending and we can go spoilers here but that ending is really chilling and upsetting too when he stakes him you know because again there's something so visceral and real about it as well isn't there it's like it's i love all of that stuff it's very clever well it's just it's just such a punch it's so it, it's so sudden it's like a smash cut to our main and and also the film's been getting like a bit actiony up until that point like it's getting yeah. quite like not fun because it's still really dark but it's a bit it's it's verging on a bit capery yeah with you know like a shootout with some gangsters in what looks like a cardboard box factory yeah um, <laughs> yeah like constant fucking sirens like the sound design in that in the second half of the third act is just like fire alarms and car and police sirens and car horns going off after crashes and it's just cacophony yeah. and then and then just this hard cut to a no background noise scene mm-hmm and our and our main character being absolutely devastated physically, literally. It's it's brilliant, isn't it? It's very clever. Um, yeah, I love that. And and uh, you know, I think that the I also love this idea that he is just this very very troubled teenage boy and yeah. suffering with all kinds of angst, right? Sexual angst, social angst, and and I also love and again, kind of watching this back to back with Let's Scare Jessica to Death was kind of interesting because there are a lot of moments of this film where we've got a voiceover of him talking to the radio DJ, right? The kind of disc jockey. Yes. About yeah. The count. Basically just telling him everything he's doing right and and uh, like those conversations are fascinating to listen to as well because that's when it feels like he really is the most himself right when he's talking to this kind of anonymous radio dj everything's been pretty easy since i've learned how to be careful Mm -hmm. people are the hardest thing (laughs) i understand When I see people together, they don't talk, not really. They don't say what they mean. Right. But then they they have the other, they have the sexy stuff, <laughs> whenever they want it. Yeah, he's, there's a sort of unabashed naivete to him as well, like the way he the way he describes sex, the way he describes his uncertainties and his insecurities. Yeah, very open, very childish. Yeah, and it, but that I mean, but that all leads into like you know. Again, going back to the serial killer thing, whenever a serial killer would get arrested, uh, there'd be people like supposing about them, and you know Freudian theory is still very big at this pit in this period, and people are talking about you know d- damaged relationships with mothers and the id and sexual appetites and all that kind of stuff, um, infantilization of of men and uh, like people pushing back at society, like there's all these themes g- being discussed in relation to the the nation's obsession with serial killers, and a lot of that is transferred over to Martin. Mm. You know, he is this this troubled kid. I don't I don't think we're ever really told that we should sympathise with him. The fact that it starts so early on with that horrible murder, right? You never feel you never feel like you're you're rooting for him personally. No, no, no. But um, um 
But it's a very uh, it's a very matter of fact portrayal of him. Like it just shows him. Yes, and it's very it's so matter of fact that it is almost easy to forget what he does in that opening scene. You know, during the rest of the film, when you're watching him be this kind of naive, like you say, kind of quite innocent sounding boy as well. And uh, yeah, I think that is. He's not like Alex from A Clockwork Orange or something, right? Like, as far as kind of, like, teenage kind of antagonists go in these No, not at all. I think it does feel as though it's being portrayed like a sickness of some kind. Yes, definitely. Whereas whereas Alex in, in Clockwork Orange is is sadistic. He's, he's, he's thrill kill. Yeah. Whereas... Whereas this this guy needs serious help. Yeah, yeah. And and there's not there's not really um much um there's not really much worry either from him or from the film that he's gonna get caught by the police or anything either. You know, at least not until the final act. Like he's murdering people in these kind of often quite public places and then just kind of moving on, right? And again, there is something very matter of fact about all of that, you know? It's all of that's really interesting too, I think. And and dark, you know. It's kind of some of these things feel like they're happening in kind of broad daylight, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It it does feel very brazen. Um, almost like he doesn't know how wrong it is. Absolutely, yeah, he seems completely clueless in that regard. Um, and then, of course, these really grisly murders happen and we're reminded of just what a monster he is, right? Um, so, and let's talk about those murder sequences. I mean, this, I guess, kind of historically, is one of the first ever movies uh, in which Tom Savini does the practical effects, right? And Tom Savini and Romero, this is their first collaboration. Um, and, of course, they would go on to work together on a bunch of stuff. This was pre-Dawn of the Dead and then all of the 80 slashes that Tom Savini did you know but but what do you think of the kind of especially you know from your perspective as a practical effects artist Dan what do you think of the effects here yeah they're they're fun they don't like they haven't aged beautifully they're not all perfect uh you know the the stake at the end doesn't move with the with Martin's chest this is convulsing (laughs) yeah uh but then also, you know, happy accidents. The the blade not quite cutting the girl's wrist at the beginning was a misfire on the rig. Mm, um, mm-hmm. And they just kept it in in the edit. Uh, uh, Savini, Savini told me personally, <laughs> Savini told me about how he, he got the the job. Um, they'd known each other and he'd wanted, uh, Romero had wanted him to do um, Night of the Living Dead, but he was in the army. Um, yeah. Yeah. But he, yeah, so he he went in to sort of say, oh, I should I should do this job. Um, Romero had wanted him. He went in to meet the producers, and he went in with the razor blade rig from that opening scene. Just pulled his sleeve up and slit his wrist in front of the in front of the producers. Wow! Um, and they went crazy, <laughs> and he got the job. <laughs> but go. yeah, I mean, it's it's quite they're quite simple rigs, but they were. But you know, it was 1977. He was. You know, he was making this stuff up and he did a great job with it, I think. Yeah, and at this point, I don't think Romero was working with big budgets still, was he, or anything? I mean, obviously, famously, he didn't really make much of Night of the Living Dead, did he? And and I, I, I this movie was kind of very small, wasn't it? Wasn't it basically him and a bunch of hit, like people he already knew filming in one of their homes? Like, I, I, you know, it, was, it feels like a particularly kind of small project, this movie that he was making. Yeah, I know that they changed the name of the character to match the name of the shop that they were shooting. Shooting in right because <laughs> they couldn't couldn't afford to have a new sign made um yeah but yeah i mean it's all it's obviously very I mean, and it made no money either no um but romero always referred to it as his favorite of his films it's great i mean uh yeah i think it's up i think it's up there for me i think it might be maybe next to night of the living dead my my favorite romero film it is absolutely tremendous isn't it I'm yeah gonna, and and yeah again maybe again like similar to let's scare jessica to death it's it's probably a movie that's sort of grown in people's opinions over time i imagine but also it's i think it's imminently going to get a nice new release isn't it i think like a, bru- a blu-ray release because it's not really had that as yet in the uk as well no we yeah we are it, the the release was delayed because there was briefly a possibility that, that they'd be able to get hold of the really like the extra 45 minute or extra hour long whatever it is work print that went on that got sold at auction uh last Mm -hmm. year and then that didn't happen so 
we'll get a beautiful release and then presumably within the next year or so there will also be a release with that version on it oh wow okay but i don't know what that person is holding out for because no. god damn it i want to watch that version right uh, like you say the original cut of the film ran for two hours and 45 minutes which is nuts but if there was a chance to see that extended version i'd love to see it and see what it looks like yeah um so and let me ask you a little bit about some of these other characters as well because there are some really interesting women in this film too obviously you've got his another member of his family christina played by christine forrest uh, and you've got this other character of this kind of housewife right i think her name's abby um who he kind of sparks up a relationship with um what do you make of their dynamic um because for me this is really it's when he's with that housewife that you really suddenly feel how young and naive he is you know yeah i think that's that's part of the whole like presenting it very matter of factly yeah by having by having that element in it feels all the more just like a slice of his life yeah you remind me of an old cat i used to have i mean that to sound funny i had an old alley cat he used to sit on the floor and stare up at me with those eyes I really used to be able to talk to that old cat. He just listened and listened till I got it all out of my system. He never said anything either. He never talked back. How does sex kind of play into this, do you think? You know, I mean, like you say, he doesn't actually sexually assault any of these women, even though it looks like he's going to at times. He's a virgin through the bulk of the film. Um, he, like you say, he's got that kind of naivety. He refers to sex as that sexy stuff. But is there something sexual, do you think, in the way that he chooses his victims? They're nearly always women, um, women of a particular type, I suppose. You know, so is there something sexual in that? Well, so the, the, the two positions on that are, yes, obviously, he's male, he strips them naked. Like, he is, even if he doesn't quite understand what he's doing, because when we see the first couple of murders, he's still a virgin. Um... But he is also, because of these black and white sequences, he is obviously, and he's been told about vampirism and he's probably watched vampire films and he he has this idea of what a vampire is and how a vampire behaves and what a vampire does. Um, so, like, it, it's almost like he's sort of like going through the motions of this stuff and he doesn't understand the sexual aspect of it. Yeah. You want me here for sex, don't you? I never really did it before. I was always too shy. But I decided I'd really like to do it with you. Um, well, there you go. I mean, why do you think this film wasn't as well received as, for example, Romero's other films? Is, is it because people kind of had that expectation of what it was going to be, thinking it was going to be more of a traditional vampire movie and it it just gave them something so different? Do you think that's the reason people didn't embrace it? Yeah, I mean, anyone wanting a Christopher Lee or a you know Todd Browning vampire film mm. is going to be sorely disappointed yeah. by this movie. Yeah. Um, and then also, like, you know, serial killer cinema hadn't really kicked off at this point. No. Um, I mean, what do you have? Like, you'd already had The Town That Dreaded Sundown by this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, you know, sort of quasi stuff like Night of the Hunter. But but it wasn't a, it wasn't a booming genre. Like, you know, people weren't pouring money into that. I mean, not that they ever really have. But, but also, like, those films are grim. Like, the good ones are disturbing and upsetting. And I don't think mainstream audiences want that. Like, they want to be a little bit scared. If the, You know, when a mainstream audience goes to watch a horror film, they want to jump a bit, they want to leave giggling with their friends, and that's it. They don't want to leave, like, and be genuinely horrified. Not normal people. Like, we no. do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you know, and we, we said when we were talking about Let's Get Jessica to Jessica to death. A film doesn't have to be a horror film. Doesn't have to be scary to be successful. No. I think there are loads of different ways in which a horror film can can be successful. But an like a, a mainstream audience, particularly nowadays, but I suspect back in the seventies as well, they they do want to be scared, but within very strict parameters. They don't want to have a mirror turned to society. No, <laughs> they don't want to be made to feel terrible. I want a film to pull my spine out of my mouth. Like I want to feel <laughs> hollow by the end of a movie. Uh, and this very much ticks that box. Is particularly well, I mean, I must have been like sixteen when I saw this, mm. fifteen, sixteen, and it absolutely blew me away. Like. 
Jessica had to grow on me. This film I loved mm-hmm. right from the get go, and I made a bunch of people watch it, and almost none of them thanked me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, it is. It's it's really tremendous, and yeah, I think you're right. I think you're. Right. I think it's just probably a lot bleaker than maybe people might have initially expected. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this was uh, also along with Dawn of the Dead, right? Wasn't this also kind of re-edited by Argento for a kind of European release? Is that right? And and I, I like. I think it was given a Goblin score for it as well which is hilarious i've never seen that version no no i don't even know if you can get that version this is just what i've read but i mean that's brilliant i'd love to see this with a goblin score <laughs> i don't know if i would i mean obviously i would obviously i, I want to see it because i want to have seen all the versions yeah. but because i'm a weird completist but i can't imagine it being better no no definitely not and it was also uh wasn't it one of the video nasties i think it was one of the uh yeah it was it was seized and confiscated under section three of the publications act during the video nasty panic as well which is interesting but i guess like again it's got that kind of nasty serial killer edge to it doesn't it i suppose it does and also you have to remember that actually the video nasty list really wasn't anything like the badge of severity that it was promised to be no no um a lot of those films were boring nonsense um it was just about salacious names this doesn't fit that category someone enough people have complained about it i can i can definitely imagine this falling into that category yeah yeah like pe- people people not knowing what it was going to be oh it's just a nice vampire movie it's called martin let's watch that <laughs> exactly i'm phoning the director of public prosecutions <laughs> <laughs> i'm so incensed <laughs> it's so true um well there you go anything else you want to mention it feels like such a rich film and i don't want to miss anything out but are there any other key moments or elements of this film that you want to call out or, or discuss uh no i think we've kind of covered it like it's just it's it's just it's like a really uncomfortable hug this movie <laughs> it is you're so right about that and again actually one thing we didn't mention really was john amplis's performance right i mean again absolutely tremendous like you say even that a kind of uncomfortable hug it kind of balancing a sort of almost sweetness with something incredibly creepy at the same time you know yeah absolutely and and uh, actually one thing that is worth worth mentioning is the 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 mirroring of the death of his second cousin Mm-hmm. with with how he kills because he ultimately is is killed possibly for something he didn't do because his because his the young the, his his cousin's daughter who i does that make him her his cousin once removed or yes, his second cousin second, i can never work, I th- do the maths I on that i think it's second cousin but yeah something like that yeah she kills herself with a, with a razor blade so it's entirely possible that old cousin thinks that he killed her mm mm-hmm. mhm Yes, because that is interesting as well, isn't it? That he shows no sign of wanting to kill either of his cousins, right? Of of the of the old man or the or the lady that they li- that he's living with. So that's that in itself is also kind of interesting. Absolutely. Well, his but his killing of men in the film is always um, out of necessity. True. His yeah. his fantasy kills are always female. The first man we see him kill is the is the guy that that woman's having an affair with that he doesn't expect to to find yeah that's um, true at home and then later he kills that guy by like stabbing him in the neck <laughs> with right a, with a pole but again that's all kind of just part of needing needing to to to, to get away so yeah i don't think he's he's not he's he's very uh He's not very equal opportunities in his murder. Um, well, there you go. What a film. What a tremendous film. I was so glad to give it a rewatch um, and uh, and discuss it with you, Dan. And how do you think the... F- I mean, I'm guessing you think it holds up pretty well, right? But how do you find it now? And how do you think uh, sort of 2022 audiences will find this watching it for the first time? Yeah, I mean, again, it's always so difficult, isn't it? Yeah. I, I think you have to assume that someone who watches a film, you know, a, a George Romero film that isn't particularly famous compared to some of his other stuff... Yeah. for the first time in 2022 is probably going to be more likely to enjoy it yeah. than just someone who maybe even even at the era that it was made just randomly gets it off the shelf yeah there's still a possibility that it's going to ostracize people with how dark it is how unpleasant it is um but also i think it's going to find a bunch of new fans 
I know. I'm so excited for this new release because, like, I think, you know, that's going to be really exciting. And I think it will find a bunch of new fans, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm hoping it gets some big screen playings off the back of the new release as well. I'd love to go and see it in a packed cinema. That would be great. Yeah. Um, and I didn't properly get to ask you this, actually, at the beginning. Um, but w- where does this rank for you in Romero's filmography? Is it your favourite Romero film? It's really hard. I mean, that that, that kind of changes on a... <laughs> yeah, of <laughs> on course. A, on a rotor, roster, rotor. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I've. It's up there with Night of the Living Dead, for what I consider to be his dark films, which is like Night of the Living Dead, this, The Crazies. Yeah. Um, I guess Season of the Witch kind of fits into that as well, even though it's just a bit, it's a bit more dreamy, which I also really like. Those tend to be my favourite of his movies. Yeah, me too. Um. Obviously, I've got a lot of love for Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, mm-hmm. Monkey Shines. But, yeah, it's definitely up there. Top two? Yeah, I, I would agree with you, definitely. Uh, and it does, it's 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 of that early Romero era, isn't it, and vibe compared to sort of Dawn onwards, I think. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love it. I really love it. Um, I've, um, I've still not gotten around to seeing Amusement Park yet. No, I haven't either. It's on Shudder. It's, it is on Shudder, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I really need to get to that as well. Although I didn't actually hear great things from people that did see it, sadly. But I am I'm going to have to check it out at some point. Yeah, yeah. got to watch yeah. it. Got to watch it. Um, amazing. Well, Dan, there you go. My last question was going to be for you. What is your favourite vampire film? But it's but it's this, is it? It's Martin. Yeah, it's Martin. Um, what do you think is the future of the vampire movie? Do you think it's going to be a, a type of a, a character and archetype that is going to continue to be popular uh and do you think we'll ever get another good dracula adaptation as well on that note (laughs) yeah i mean i don't know it's so hard i I think we're getting to a point now where works of classic literature that have been adapted multiple times it's like now there's in you know between a rock and a hard place because either they do a faithful adaptation in which case it contains nothing we haven't seen before yeah or they go their own way and put a new twist on it in which case everyone's annoyed with them. yeah yeah so I think it's, yeah, it's very difficult. Um, I think the vampire will stick around. I don't see any reason for it to go away. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if we have, we've really got much length left in the, uh, in the classic sex pest vampire, just because like modern like sensibilities are changing so much, which is no bad thing. Um, like it's not like they've erased all these old films. We just, you know, watch them knowing better. <laughs> uh, right. I'd like to see some more scary, scary vamp. You know, like a kind of Nosferatu or Mister Barlow type. You know, like slightly more monstrous well, vampires, right? <laughs> you know, you know that there's a there's a, a a very fancy Nosferatu adaptation in the works, which I'm very excited about. Is this Robert Eggers or is this someone else? It is indeed. Oh, yeah. I know. I'm so excited about this. Yeah, cannot wait. Wait. So yeah, I think I think if if we've got anyone around at the moment who can who can deliver a, a good new version of Nosferatu, yeah, it's Rob. <laughs> it's Eggers, absolutely. Yeah, agreed. Um, amazing. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining me. It's always such a pleasure to chat about movies with you. And uh, just remind us where people can find you and more of your work and more of your stuff out there online. Uh, so on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at 13fingerfx, uh, and I co-host the Arrow Video Podcast with Sam Ashurst. Uh, every couple of weeks, uh, we put up um, an episode centred around one of the titles from the Arrow catalogue. Yes. And then also just some films. There are some films that I did effects for out there. <laughs> uh, four of them at Fright Fest, lots of them coming up that I can't talk about yet. Um. Yeah, I hope people watch and enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, love it. Very exciting. And like you said, like we said, you know, if you're if you're uh, if you're London or within reach of London, come to Fright Fest. Come see come see Dan's films. Come say hello to us all in the pub. Yeah, absolutely. When is this? When's this going up? Uh, like literally this Friday. So in like three days time. Come to Human Condition on August the first at the Prince Charles and say hi to me. Uh, it. It's it's one of the most heartbreaking films you'll ever see. If you like Martin and you like films that pull your spine out three about, <laughs> <laughs> okay. come and watch a three hour Japanese uh, war movie about uh, uh, about honor in the face of brutality. <laughs> 
Amazing. What an offer. Amazing. Well, there you go. Dan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's brilliant guest, Dan Martin. It's always such a pleasure to have Dan on the podcast. So clearly, Dan and I were both huge fans of those two movies. What do you guys think of Let's Scare Jessica to Death and Martin? Do you like these movies? Do you think these movies are even vampire films? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please do get in touch. You can email me, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd, all the socials. And if you want to discuss this week's episode or anything else horror related with fellow listeners, there are two places you can go. You can join the Evolution of Horror discord or you can sign up to the evolution of horror discussion group and you can find that on facebook if you want to support this podcast financially and get treated to regular bonus content then sign up to our patreon patreon.com slash evolution of horror if you want to support this podcast but you can't afford to do so financially a great way to support us is to leave us a rating and review on apple podcasts or whichever pod app you use as that really helps us get discovered by new listeners Okay, on to next week then, and our vampire series continues with two more brilliant, weird, innovative movies to discuss. Next week, I'm going to be joined by a brand new guest, Tanana Reeve Jew, and we are going to be discussing two black exploitation vampire movies from the 1970s Blackula from 1971 and Ganja and Hess from 1972. Two incredible movies, two movies with tons to discuss. I cannot wait. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. Evolution.